scholar, civil rights activist, and teacher, Alice Walker is one of the preeminent writers of the late 20th and early 21st century. Perhaps best known for her novel, The Color Purple, published in 1982, Walker has become an important public intellectual. When it comes to American literature, in addition to her own writing, Walker has helped shape our high school and college curricula. She, quote, rediscovered Zora Neale Hurston. In 1983, when she published In Search of Our Mother's Garden, a collection of essays, she not only developed the idea of a womanist theory grounded in black feminist, she brought Zora Neale Hurston back to public attention. She wrote about traveling to Eatonville to find Zora Neale Hurston's grave. It was unmarked, and she took it upon herself to erect a gravestone there, which reads Zora Neale Hurston, novelist, folklorist, anthropologist, 1901-1960. The video that follows is old. It was recorded in 1992 when Walker was in her 40s but it provides a wonderful overview of Walker's early life, her philosophy, and approach to writing. Take a look. All winter long, I've borne the knife that presses without ceasing against my heart. Despising lies, I have told everyone the truth. Truth is killing me. Born in 1944 in Eatonton, Georgia, Pulitzer Prize-winning author Alice Walker grew up a continent apart from her present home 100 miles north of San Francisco. She was the eighth child of black sharecroppers. I was born in a very small village in the country in Georgia, far from the town so that when I was growing up we, we would go in once a week on Saturday. Uh, and that was when I would see more people than I'd ever seen. You know, I would see maybe 50 people in town. But day to day, I saw mostly my parents and my, my siblings and the people that my parents worked for. We um, grew cotton and corn, and my parents worked in a dairy. And there was lots of hard work. You know, we all worked. Um, I have seven brothers and sisters, and we always lived in very bad housing, very shabby housing, so that, uh, and very crowded, so that I started to um, go outside a lot. I mean, I used to just spend my, my time out, out of doors, in the trees and uh, in the fields. Um, and I think that my writing is rooted in that need to have lots of space around me. And wherever I have lived, I've always longed 
for a space and I get my best thoughts when I'm walking outside. When Alice was eight, she had an accident. One of her brothers shot her in the eye. The injury was not treated, and Alice lost the use of that eye forever. It had a very deep um, impact on my life because there was a big, um, big sort of glob of scar tissue on it, and this made, made it look very different, you know, from the other eye. And I was always very ashamed of it. But to compound my own feeling of shame uh, and sadness and, and the feeling of loss was the fact that my parents, rather than sending my brother away or even reprimanding him very much or even blaming themselves for having bought him the gun, uh, instead they sent me away. And I, I went away and I lived with my grandparents for a year. And this was very difficult because I couldn't understand why they had done this. And it always seemed to me that they did it because I had done something wrong and I couldn't see that I had. I wanted to be a scientist uh, because I thought then that scientists really helped people. I don't really believe that much anymore. Um, but um, I also wanted to play the piano and I did that as long as I could. I, I had to pay 50 cents for piano lessons. And the only way I could raise the money was by selling eggs that my mother gave me to sell. And unfortunately, the, I couldn't make enough money. There were not enough eggs to sell every week to make the 50 cents, so I stopped playing the piano or learning to play the piano. Having been unable to play the piano and unable to paint, which I also wanted to do, I started to write because it was cheaper. And also because once I started, I understood that it could help me. It could help me um, not feel so sad and not, not feel so alone. And by putting my feelings on paper, I could analyze them and I could see from day to day uh, whether I was in fact getting better, you know, feeling better about myself. And I was. And I, I really, I still keep a journal. And it's, it's in a way the same journal that I started keeping when I was a very small child. In the early 60s, students throughout the South joined in the civil rights movement, including Alice, who was attending Spelman College. She later transferred to Sarah Lawrence, and with the rise of black nationalism, traveled to Africa. The freedom struggle affected her deeply. Well, it was exciting because everybody was involved in, in protest. And it was the first time that I had seen so many people uh, determined to change a really repressive political and social system. It was our apartheid, you know, that period. Segregation was our apartheid. And people really were uh, jubilant because they were active. And it was, it was a wonderful feeling to know, to see that in so many people. I mean, you, you can see in yourself when you are, are depressed about something that if you act, you can suddenly lift yourself out of it, you know. But to see that on a, mass, a, a massive scale, to see thousands of students um, looking so joyous, even though they'd just come out of jail or they were just going to jail or they were, you know, they, some of them, I remember one boy had been forced to drink a bottle of ammonia. Uh, by, you know, racists who had, had grabbed him and, and done this to him. And he was really in, in the hospital for a while, but when he came out, he was perfectly happy. I mean, he was, he was very glad that he had been able to, you know, uh, fight and, uh, and express himself. Soon after graduation, Alice returned to the South, this time to Mississippi, to teach history to Head Start teachers. There she met Mel Leventhal. They were married for 10 years. I had met a young Jewish law student while I was there the summer before we went back to live. And um, he, was, he was courageous, he was great. He would go out in, into the most fearful communities to talk to people who had, been, who, who had suffered you know, from some kind of horrible you know, injustice, beatings, or had, you know, being thrown off the plantations. Um, and I admired him very much, 
and I, I thought that together we could do a lot of things. Uh, and we were able to. Uh, he worked as a lawyer. He desegregated um, his cases, desegregated the schools of Mississippi. <clears throat> and the first day uh, when uh, we saw all of the children going to the same schools, we, we felt really good because it was something that hadn't happened in a hundred years. One hundred years after abolition, the descendants of slaves finally dismantled the segregated plantation society of the South. Alice Walker's second novel, Meridian, was the first to chronicle the central role women played in the civil rights movement and the sexism within the movement itself. Meridian vividly expresses the theme for which Walker would become famous, women's spiritual rebirth through acts of resistance against the twin evils of racism and sexism. There were people in Mississippi who were so afraid of white people that they would just, you know, they would never look up. I mean, they were always like this, you know, and they were always doffing their caps and they were always shuffling and they were always hunched over. And, you know, there were towns in Mississippi where you couldn't walk on the sidewalk if you were a black person. So you were just always skulking about. Um, and then to see all of these people suddenly standing up and, and you know, looking straight out at you, at white people, uh, and, and, you know, presenting themselves um, as, you know, whoever they were, and with pride, and risking being killed, uh, was, a, was a wonderful thing to see. And I'll never forget it. And it will always mean to me that no matter how much your spirit has been crushed, it can unfurl again and bloom, because I've seen this. Alice moved here to the Anderson Valley to write The Color Purple when she couldn't get the book's characters to come to life while living in the city. This story of a young woman's triumph over incest, wife beating and poverty articulates a perspective Walker later would call womanist. Well, a womanist is a black feminist. It's just that as a poet, I don't like to, to have to add the word black in order to make you see something. I would prefer to use a word out of my own culture, which has all of the, the meanings that I'm, I'm trying to convey. And in our culture, womanist, uh, or womanish, unlike in white culture where it means weak, actually means a kind of um, audaciousness, you know. Uh, it means when you say that someone is acting womanish, you mean that it's usually it's a little girl who's doing this, that she's asserting herself, you know, that she is being who she is and she's acting like a woman. Um, I also wanted a word that included more of our culture than feminism does. Feminism um, always has a sort of European, you know, white uh, sound about it, you know. Um, because white women, <clears throat> even feminists, have not had the same racial struggles that we have had. They have not had, for instance, to look at their children and to see that they're all different colors, you know, and, and they've not had to then wonder, uh, you know, how, how to relate to all of these children who have different colors, and yet they're my, ch they're my children. And this is, this is something that black mothers have had to do uh, for about 500 years. In Walker's writings, womanists can flourish only if women have others to support and sustain them sisters who understand the restrictions and joys of being women in this world. Alice is a staunch advocate of sisterhood in her own personal and political life. Ironically, too, because I have two sisters, and I'm not particularly close to either of them, uh, though I, I have struggled to be close to them. Uh, I, uh, w what I have, have decided, what I've come to, to know is that my sisterhood, even with them, is based on my understanding of the oppression of women 
And so where I have disagreements with them, I am also able to see uh, how life has shaped whatever they have become. Some critics complain that Walker's male characters are overly cruel or inept. Well, let me back up a minute. I used to think that black people were better than white people. But now I really can't say that. You know, I can say that many black people really are better than many, maybe more, most white people. But um, experience has taught me that I, I can't, you know, I, I really can't say that, that all black people are better than all white people because they're not. And in the same way, um, I, I don't think I could say that all women are better, you know. Um, and, and one of the reasons I can't say that is because I do think we would have to see women exercising the full range of her power in the world to have an understanding of what woman is. We don't really know yet. And also, sometimes people seem to be better only because they are so oppressed and they have learned ways uh, to get what they need. I'm tired and I'm at times pessimistic, but overall I'm an optimist. And I'm an optimist not because I think that you know, the world will survive. Um, I'm an optimist because I have been privileged to see some of the moments of personal triumph in the world. And I've seen people transform themselves, you know, through great struggle. And I've seen them become fascinating and beautiful when they might have been only exhausted and pitiable. I would say that being black, being a woman, and being a writer it's just the most wonderful challenge. I, I don't see it as a problem, really. Mainly because I think it's, it's like having three eyes rather than one, you know? <laughs> or three hearts rather than one, or a very big heart that can have all of these things going on. So I feel blessed rather than, than not to be able to have all of these, you know, these, these places in myself from which to draw. <laughs>